again yeah, thank you. For, for the wonderful presentation. Sally, should we uh, go to the next one? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, Sala, bringing uh, up the next presentation, I'd like to uh, introduce our second speaker, Mr. Mike Kelly from Encore Technology. Mike is Vice President of Advanced Packaging and Technology Integration, and he's presenting the material actually prepared by uh, Mr. Ron Hugh Miller. As you heard from Sala earlier, unfortunately he has a family emergency today and couldn't join us. Ron is the Corporate Vice President of Global R&D and Technology Strategy. So now back, uh, back to Mike. Mike joined Amacor in 2005 and has led packaging development for EMI shielding, thermally enhanced packages, sensors, and high density MCM packages, including 2.5 D TSV and high density fan out. Mike has worked in the electronics and IC industry for over 25 years, managing projects ranging from polyester flexible circuits to eutectic flip chip, IC package design, and the signal integrity. Mike has more than 40 patents and hold master degree in mechanical and chemical engineering. Please give your warm welcome to Mike. Mike, the floor is yours. Hi, Mike. Can you unmute? We're ready for you. Well, and then maybe I'm going to try and um, unmute him direct on the uh, on his computer. Hopefully that'll work. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, finally, yes, all good. Excellent. Sorry about that, sorry about that. <laughs> Something about five mute keys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, good morning and good evening. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, unfortunately, Ron couldn't be here, but he did want me to send his greetings. Uh, this is a very exciting and challenging time in the IC package industry. So it's it's a good it's a good time. I've been in this business a while myself, and it's uh, very impressive the time frame we find ourselves in. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Very well. Good. I'm relocating this mic just a little bit. So I want to talk about key market trends. Uh, a vision of the future and uh, some of the economic realities and then a quick summary. Okay, market trends, a uh, little bit of lag here, I'm not sure why, but um, broken this down into four main categories, mobility, the mobile market, IOT consumer, automotive and high performance compute. And in each of these, there are some primary drivers, uh, especially when it comes to packaging, but at the product level too. Uh, certainly in mobility integration and size, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, is preeminent. IoT and consumer, also integration, of course, power sensitivity, low power is key and miniaturization as well. Automotive is a booming market. Um, 5G is working its way into that uh, design space. And certainly things in autonomous driving and safety assisted ADAS systems are really driving electronics uh, in a pretty big way. Again, integration shows up. So in high performance compute, um, this is a, a fast evolving area as well. And Performance, of course, is king in most of these applications, but that is being uh, attained by doing things like integration of functionality at the package level, especially to support AI, but networking too, and challenges in uh, thermal power and, and uh, power density. First though, on the RF side, uh, on the mobile IC side, it's interesting. Uh, to take a quick look at this, certainly the RF content is the story here. 
Um, if you look back to 2015, RF content in the phones was something like five bucks. In 2020, a five-fold increase. A lot of this, as you know, has been driven by the number of filters and bands required in the high-end phones, but there are over 120 uh, high-end phone packaging opportunities if you look uh, at some of these teardowns. So it's a very uh, intense uh, high-tech field, as we all know. This is kind of a breakdown in 2020. RF front-end modules are 49% of the growth. And you can see that on the, uh, the time-phased bar chart over here, a big, uh, a big growth over time expected in uh, front-end modules, but also RF discretes. Uh, the uh, API and the compute sections are still there, of course, and critically important, as you know, but, but the growth sector seems to be now in the RF side. <laughs> IoT and, co and consumer ICs, um, we're grouping these together for this slide, but it still requires very advanced packaging technology. Connectivity and miniaturization of all this functionality is is something that is absolutely required. Uh, Multi-stimulus integration, sensor fusion techniques, power efficiency as mentioned. Automotives, again, um, an awful lot of design content going into the electrical systems, MEMS and sensors. This is a $35 billion market. And if you uh, just consider infotainment, that's a dollar ad of something like $100. But, whoops, sorry, $100. But if you combine that with electrification and ADAX, ADAX, that can actually be up to $2,000 per car. So there's a huge market opportunity here. And that, you know, uh, addresses or needs to address just the networking side of the automobile, especially in the high end. Already, two terabyte per hour is not uncommon in the high end, but that's going to actually go up as projected in 2025, about tenfold. In, in high performance compute, there is a, a breakdown here of, of semi-content by, by product and by package for the AI and high performance compute network and servers. And you know, even if you get down all the way into the just the package level, this is expected to be a $15 billion opportunity by 2025. So it's large, and a lot of this uh, in the high performance end is being driven by data, data that is coming from all of our edge devices, and the ability to take this with AI algorithms and extract really meaningful data out of this, either in real time or offline. There's so many applications that are looking for AI, I, I kind of think of this as a, a super sophisticated linear regression or a multilinear regression, but finding re relationships and data that you can't find any other way. The edge, of course, is where the data's coming from. That's phones, it's computers, and having local AI is becoming increasingly important. You see AI cores in lots of uh, embedded products nowadays. And that's really for uh, uh, one pretty simple reason. You just can't afford a round trip signal all the way to a central cloud server uh, data center for some of these uh, operations. Sometimes it's fine, but as more and more real time applications are coming about, we're gonna have to have more smarts out at the edge. And that means building in more smarts in the silicon and the, and the products that handle them from a package standpoint. So, you know, big data is really the genie in the bottle. This is nothing new, but it, it is now, you know, four or five years in, we can see how hard this big data is really driving, driving silicon, but also driving the package solution. Um, the, the data that is uh, coming from the edge devices and the wireless standards to support higher and higher uh, data bandwidths and then being able to handle that in maybe edge servers or all the way to a major cloud uh, data center somewhere and then process it there 
and come back for extract date in a meaningful way for for you know industries that literally didn't exist even three or four years ago. Um, if you take the time to go take a look at uh, data scientist, um, I NVIDIA is one of those companies, but there are many others that have really good uh, websites on that. And it's it's a it's a proliferation of of new and novel things you can only do with AI and then things that you can do much better with AI. So it's here to stay. It's, it's going to make our worlds better. It is driving things very hard because data means speed. It means performance. It means power. And, you know, I think we're, we're looking at something like, uh, where is it here? 14 terabit of data per day now uh, coming to the data center or even to the edge. But by 2025, the, the forecast is for 175 zettabytes. And I, I think that's to the 15th power, but correct me if I'm wrong, it's a lot of data. What does it mean? What does it mean to us in, in silicon and packaging, die sizes, more and more functionality? Um, I used to think a long time ago that, gee, with uh, the explosion in Moore's law and transistor shrinkages, somehow those ICs were gonna get smaller. That's never happened. ICs continue to be large, at least in the high performance world. And power density is one of those things that isn't decreasing. Even though transistor power per transistor is going down, you know, the, the, uh, the, the transistor density is going up faster. So power density, is going in the wrong direction. And heterogeneous integration, putting more and more content into a single package, that's really good for actually total power. It lowers the total power of a prod product by eliminating a lot of the source, oops, excuse me, a lot of the source of power because you don't have to drive uh, data across long IO uh, buses on a board or even a package in some case. But still, heterogeneous integration is providing that performance at an acceptable power, but power density is going up. So what does it mean? This is the vision, um, uh, this is Ron's vision in particular across the uh, Amcor spectrum. A lot of modularity. So there's a lot of words out there to describe it, but especially in miniaturized cases, SIP and high density form factor, so you can miniaturize and lower power at the same time, lower total power. Uh, that's an important trend. In IoT and 5G and AI, there's new electrical microsystems that are being implemented for functionality, certainly advanced materials. So because speeds are going up, because memory bandwidth in particular needs to go up, we now have chiplets that are deconstructions or just augmentations of SOC approaches, they have fast bus types. And so it's important to pay attention to electrical properties. Mechanically, things are getting more challenging too. You can put more things into one package. That's a good thing for the industry. It taxes the, mecha the uh, mechanical stresses, the warpages, and you know the size and the equipment required to do it in a, in a pretty dramatic fashion. I can't say enough about power, power density. If you look at the trends for power density, um, power per unit of area, power per unit of silicon area, or, or other metrics, it might be power per unit of package area, that trend is going up. And so power and power dissipation and doing it at an affordable price point is becoming more and more important or continuing in its importance, probably a better way to say it. If I think about the, uh, you know, the IoT and mobile and uh, the automotive centers of uh, our markets, this is just a, a kind of a cross section of what we see, especially on 3D and 5G. But you can see that all these packages are some kind of integration, whether it's uh, integrating an antenna, or it's integrating multiple die and you know maybe disparate RF and logic devices and components. Sometimes there's shielding if there's RF de devices required in here, but definitely complex modular systems. That is definitely one of the keywords 
uh, especially in these three development paths. In the high performance packaging, the big trend uh, to support AI, because it was pushing for that performance level the hardest, is getting memory close to compute. And so getting memory from being off package or even uh, you know off board on uh, memory dims into and closer to the processor so that you can have that kind of memory bandwidth that HBM2 and 2E brings to the compute centers and not drive power exponentially hard at the same time. You just can't afford it. Us, you know, you, you, we often think of power, performance per watt in the mobile space, but data centers are probably just as sensitive to this. Um, you know, power is typically 50% of total cost, power cooling and power dissipation. So there's a huge push inside the customer base to keep performance on an upward trend, but you've got to manage power. One of the best ways to do that is get memory really close to the, the compute die, whether it's an ASIC or whether it's an FPGA or whether it's a, a GPU or CPU, that's a big trend. Uh, that's supposed to be the memory bandwidth there. So SOCs, we, we, we've been doing these for a long time. We know how. Um, it has got us a long ways down the road. For most devices, or at least many devices, SOCs are perfect, uh, a perfect conclusion for how to meet the needs. Some devices, though, especially as we're going into the the more expensive wafer nodes, seven, five, and three. Putting all the functionality in a single die and affording that yield loss may not be the best economic sense, and there may be other ways. One of those is chiplets. So this is a cartoon cross-section, but pretty typical of what we see. A big compute die of some kind, most likely it's, a, it's an ASIC or a GPU in combination with you know, an eight high stack of HBM memory, lots of DRAM bandwidth and capacity locally. And then these could be uh, discrete, long reach, high speed IO series die in the same package on the same module. Um, one of the things that probably can't emphasize enough coming back to power, you know, data locality is a term that is, is, seems to be catching on as a buzzword today, but it's a fancy way of saying, where's the memory located relative to the compute die? Of course, if you've got cache on chip, accessing that memory is low power. But the further you get away, the power goes up, you know, non-linearly. Even HBM, which is a, a low power option for in-package memory, is a 10x, but if you gotta go off chip, if you've gotta go off package, that is so expensive in real terms. It's a hundred times the power to reach off package and go out there to a, a DDR RAM of some kind. So that has driven us uh, primarily in the first step into the TSV silicon interposer. This is a great technology. Um, it's been around for five or six years. It's been in HVM for five years now. So it's, it's literally rock solid. If you need to integrate ASICs and HBM or even other devices on a silicon interposer, it's readily doable. You know, uh, the, there is a good supply chain to support it. There's several companies building interposers. There are several OSATs who can do the assembly for you, including the foundries. And so this is a go-to for uh, that kind of integration. Now, you know, what's coming up now is uh, what I call the second step without TSVs. And these are mostly high-density fan-out RDL constructions of one kind or another. Um, most of these are three or four signal layers. If you're going to route the HBM bus, you actually need two micron line in space uh, to get that data bus routed. And electrically, that material, that dielectric that's in here, most, most of these are some kind of polyimide. That dielectric is 
better suited to high speed operation. So sometimes in these in these interfaces between a die and let's say this was a, a, a high speed IO chiplet, these interfaces might be 10 or 20 or even 40 gigabit per second per line. So you really have to have a decent electrical dielectric to handle that. And that I think is where the HDFO module is gonna come into its own, is integrating uh, chiplets, whether they're all logic, uh, all CMOS or a mixture of RF and, and CMOS is, is really going to shine. We're, we're working on uh, uh, taking this into production now. We have qualified silicon to silic chiplets constructions, and, and the next step is uh, HBM. So uh, this is just a concept. Uh, uh, I won't waste much time here, but if you have a lot of CERTES and you know, a lot of time the networking guys talk about this as the beachfront. How much linear room do you have to put high-speed CERTES channels? And you're limited, uh, especially if you're combining this thing with other devices on the other two sides. By breaking out the, the high-speed CERTES die into discrete die, and probably sourcing those in a lower cost, uh, older node that is just good enough but isn't overkill for it is a more cost effective path too. It does require an infrastructure. These, these drivers and the ability to you know, integrate them at the package level is, is an infrastructure inside the packaging and the silicon world to make that happen. Um, but certainly we see a ton of interest in doing these. Our first products are you know, in the design phase now for discrete CERTES chiplets. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's probably the lowest hanging fruit is take something like a really complex, you know, RF high-speed CERTES I.O. block. It's a ton of person hours to get it designed and qualified and working just the way you want it. And the ability to use it over and over again and not have to roll it to the next new silicon node is a big deal for most companies. So, so that's the low hanging fruit, but if you look at any die nowadays, you know, whether it's a mobile or whether it's a really high end, you know, high performance compute processor, there's, there's blocks and accelerators of many different kinds in these chips. And so some of these like memory controllers and certainly AI cores, uh, but also, you know, compute cores are candidates for chiplets and, you know, that type of construction. And we're seeing that already in the marketplace. So, you know, some of the leading companies that have invested in chiplet approaches are already pushing out their, their first products or maybe working on their second generation. Back to packaging for a second, you know, one of the things that you know, if you if you compare the advancement of silicon node and Moore's law and transistor density, and you compare that to packaging, it's never a very favorable comparison, right? I mean, you know, silicon has been marching two years at a time, and you know, on a on trying to stay on a logarithmic graph of transistor density, packaging is is behind. It's it's only behind because it's a much different physical system, and it's actually a much more complicated from a stress standpoint to manage really fine copper pillar and interconnect density. But it is moving along. And as the, uh, the previous speaker spoke of, you know, hybrid bonding and ultra fine pitch copper pillar bumps are something that we're definitely working on because there is going to be a need, you know, down in the not so distant future to be able to integrate some things 3D. You know, you've still got a power density challenge to deal with because now you've got compute blocks that are literally more dense uh, than they used to be. Instead of being spread out in 2B, there'll be some 3D stacking. But, you know, really smart EDA tools that are power aware and, you know, clock uh, domain aware are already being used to, uh, to do some of this work. So that is something that we're investing in. That is part of the future. Um, if I stop for a second and just sort of look at the, the uh, suite of solutions across the MCM space, 
Flipchip MCM has been around for a long time and it continues to be a mainstay. There is more and more products with uh, compute and memory together than there ever used to be. And so if you can get your routing done inside of that product, that's a really great way to go. We know how to build those. Uh, they're extensions of existing technology. For some of the more advanced, uh, especially if you have high density interconnection between something like an ASIC and an HBM, you're not gonna be able to do that on a you know, build up even high tech substrates. You're going to need modules. You're going to need higher density that 2.5D provides, or that you know HDFO, which we have trademarked as Swift, provides in multi-layer RDO. And even some of the you know look-ahead solutions for bridges. Um, Intel's been out with their EMIB construction for a long time. They're productized that now. There's many different ways to do that. One, the one that we're looking at is actually using the bridge at the module level, and then that module would still in turn be attached to a large main package substrate. And then not to forget down here, power is, is continuing to be a challenge because power density is not going down. It's still increasing. So, you know, investing in things like metal TIMs and other, other really fundamentally different approaches for thermal dissipation is something that we're going to have to uh, get our arms around, especially the future, and make those investments. So just to summarize, uh, the, we feel like we are in a new era. We're, we're, we're finding a place where package integration of certain functionalities and sub chips like chiplets and memory and high speed certies uh, can be beneficial in a lot of different ways. Certainly performance, but cost, time to market. And so getting there is a new era. We have to be timely. I mean, we have to invest. Investments in these technologies are not cheap. You know, it's it's not 50 and a hundred thousand dollar investments. These are these are 50 and 100 million dollar kinds of investments to become competent and high volume capable for some of these technologies. Um, data is driving it. Big data is driving a lot of what's going on in our industry, as we know. It's certainly not the only thing, but it tends to drive our package technology sooner than some trends, and then that tends to sprinkle down into other places we can use it. But critical things like reintegration, the equipment to support that integration at the package level, uh, interconnect advancement, whether it's RDL or whether it's bridge technologies, and you know power and thermal management, we always have to include that. So this is the Ron's wrap up slide. I wish he were here to deliver it. He would do a better job, but I, I love this slide. Um, essentially, uh, you know, the, the Superman SOC can no longer carry the torch alone. Certainly it's carrying the torch in, in, in many and most products, but as heterogeneous infrastructures become more commonplace inside the silicon suppliers and the package suppliers, this reintegration and heterogeneous, you know, uh, combining of the different values into one heterogeneous package is a trend that is is driving our business really hard and it's pretty exciting too because uh, it is taking some products to places they couldn't be any other way. And that was it, thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Uh, wonderful uh, analogy at the end. Uh, I love the superpower, uh, heterogeneous integration capabilities. Uh, Sal, do we still have time for a couple questions? Yeah, absolutely. We've oh. got 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So, audience, uh, you can uh, unmute your speaker and ask questions live. Or uh, if you're shy, you can also type them in in the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um,
Well, you're getting your question ready. Um, I'd like to ask a question of my own. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you talk about the automotive industry. Um, that industry obviously have zero PPM requirement or uh, maybe PP billion, right? So right, what are right. some of the intrinsic capability or enablers uh, in packaging, right, to meet mm -hmm. this type of stringent uh, automotive requirement? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for, uh, for, not, for systems that are not safety related, just for a moment, if, if you're familiar with automotive industry, they have a set of very stringent um, reliability testing requirements there. They're, they tend to be in excess of what JEDIC requires. And so it is a fairly long cycle of reliability demonstration and root causing. You know, it's, it's, it's not just passing rail tests. It's making sure you have a full set of documentation that shows how you got through your due diligence to that point. But on the ADAS side, you know, where, where, where this high performance compute meets safety uh it is as you know a very interesting story and i don't pretend to have all the answers here but there are certainly uh, a lot of discussions going on about redundancy redundancy in silicon redundancy in interconnect too so you know a lot of packages that uh are routed today if you use uh, a high density routing strategy or routing technology to integrate dye in a package, for example, you may have enough routing density to be able to permit you to access every signal-to-signal -signal contact with a redundant line. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're starting to do some design studies in that area for customers who are really pushing the envelope on the ADAS side. This is, this is inching towards, you know, autonomous driving, but all those classes before you really get to full autonomous. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things really, you know, super stringent rel testing and documentation. And then, you know, redundancy is something that is getting pushed into the design discussion a lot more than it used to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, meanwhile, we have a few questions come through the chat and uh, couple questions. One is from Jen Vardaman, and also we have Sudkar from uh, SV uh, Silicon Valley X-Ray. They asked, for these advanced packaging technologies, what mm -hmm. type of new inspection or metrology are required uh, to meet the, re um, uh, the advanced packaging requirement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Certainly, when the, the, the OSAT industry got involved in 2.5D and developed those processes, there was metrology that had to go along with it. And, you know, a lot of that is thin film metrology, making sure your deposition thicknesses are correct and that your stress levels of, uh, you know, deposited films are correct. And so that, that was new metrology for the OSAT industry in large. That's in place now. So it's a it's rather matter of course nowadays. I think on, on the HDFO side, you know, it's, it's really important to provide enough metrology and testing that you can assure quality. So, you know, it's, it's not exactly like a substrate where you can probe from both sides and, and pretty much convince yourself you don't have any shorts and you don't have any opens. Um, it's very difficult to do this at the wafer level when you need to add dye before test, be, before, uh, before the uh, carrier is removed. So uh, I think that is one area where metrology has just gone off charts is the uh, automated inspection tools and the thoroughness and speed. You, you literally have to have 100% coverage of every layer before you can claim that you have uh, a sufficiently high quality and yield for things to make sense. So I think that's the key. That's been the key on HDFO. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. 
Um, sure. Next question is around material. It's from Herb Ryder from uh, EDA to ASIC. He asked, can you comment on the packaging material characterization to give EDA tools very accurate inputs? I, I think Herb's probably talking about on the electrical side. Um, today, you know, to be honest, most of that is vendor supplied data. So we, we have our own supply chain for these organic materials. The testing has historically been done in a very, uh, what do I want to say, standardized format so that, you know, you can compare A to B and C and it's comparing uh, those values in a, in a realistic way. But I think uh, nowadays, um, especially as new variants of all these materials are coming along that are, that are in particular addressing the mechanical side. So you've got to keep your electrical performance, but you want to tune that organic system so that it's not so stressy or its CTE value is X and not Y. Those always have an effect on, on the electrical performance too, especially, you know, the, the loss tangent is particularly sensitive to that. So, you know, I think in, in Amcor's case, we're, we're getting closer to that point where we want to be able to do those 100 gig measurements for ourselves. Right now we have a really good lab that does it for us, but it's tightly integrated into the material development pieces. And I think, for now, that's probably okay, but I think one thing we're learning is vendor supplied data is, is standardized data. It's as good as the standard is. If you need somebody that has very high frequency requirements, we may have to have specialty measurements for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes sense. Um, there's another uh, material related question from Bill Orner. He asks, has organic materials hit the wall with um, for fine pitch, bumps, trays, and space, and things like that? Well, no, no, I would say no, not yet. I mean, if you think about it, all these bumps are some type of photolithographic process. And, you know, you can. You can image uh, a five or a four micron hole in photolith organic materials and plate that. So that is, that is really one generation out from where we are now. And so I would say it hasn't hit the wall yet. But beyond that, y yes, if you have to get down to five micron pitch or smaller uh, to do some of these 3D integrations, I think that you know the organic systems to support the photolith are 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 pretty well challenged in that second generation out. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we have a follow-on question related to the automotive question I asked earlier. It's from mm -hmm. Anish. Valenki and he asked obviously you talk about the redundancy was the key point right mm -hmm. um, he asked like have it been uh, thought of or considered to look at the replaceability and preventative maintenance so for example um, if you have a part that uh, easily uh, uh, broken or something and maybe just replace it easily uh, the mm -hmm. specific package and as opposed to uh, uh, get a, a product highly highly reliable but super expensive yeah yeah it's a great question I think you know it's it, it's coming back to the total life cycle cost of these devices and I am not an expert in that in in the automotive industry uh, the data center faces the same challenges. You know, today it's hot swap boards, right? You take an entire uh, board out of a rack and and change it, and you know it's it it could have you know thousands of dollars or worth of silicon parts and many of them. Some of the really advanced uh, ADAS systems, or you know, if I if I think of for example, Tesla systems. I I believe they're the the one I've seen most recently is two uh, tailor-made AI ASICs, and that board is essentially fully redundant. I mean, you can lose one whole half of that, and everything still works. But it's certainly not part replaceable. It is still a module or a board that has to be replaced. It's hard for me to imagine 
ever getting down to part replacement unless you have parts that are not soldered to a board. Once they're soldered to a board, you have to rework them. That's a lot of heat. That's a lot of, you're taking a lot of life out of the part just to rework it. Uh, so if, if we come up with a really, you know, neat way of doing something like LGAs instead of uh, soldered PBJs, maybe that's a possibility. But as long as you have to rework something and physically melt solder to, to replace that part, I don't think that's ever going to fly, especially in, a, in, in any safety-related system like ADAS or self-driving. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting uh, uh, example from the Tesla board. Um, we have uh, more questions. Salah, we're okay on yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, next question is around uh, design rules. Do you think one micron RDL line spacing will that be the next major trend? And some people also talk about 1.5 or 1.4 yeah. alliance space, right? Do you think we need to go 1.5 first and then one micron? Is it because of the process limitation? Yeah, I think I think you hit it on the head there. I think probably 1.5 will be a stopping off point between two and one micron line in space. Um, you know, most people's steppers can be pushed to 1.5 micron. Mm -hmm. Not every, not all of them, but you know, if you, if you have a decent stepper today, you know, and you're working on two, you probably have ways to kind of sneak up on 1.5 without spending a whole bunch of CapEx on a new stepper. And, and you know, it, it's going to depend on on the guys designing the products. I mean, what did their five, you know, what do those IO blocks really need? We've got a couple of customers who have grown their IO blocks just a little bit so they can stay in 2.2. Two. Uh, and that's because the infrastructure for fabbing RDL and packaging these things isn't, isn't at 1.5 yet. 2.2 two is still state of the art. Um, if 1.5 gets you down to the smallest phi you can create, in other words, there's no reason to go to a finer pitch because I can't get my drive circuitry in a smaller space, mm. then I think we could be at 1.5 for a while. And that's, that seems to be the case in the chiplets world. It's a little hard to define perfectly, but from the example designs we've seen from customers, we think 1.5 will stick for a while, maybe three, four, five years. Eventually, though, um, if you commit to one micron line in space, you're going to look really hard at, at a bridge technology before you look at a full multi-layer uh, organic RDL approach. I think that's going to be tough. It's doable. You know, there's, there's documented literature out there of how to go do it. It's, it's a Damascene-like process. But it's not easy. It's, it's a bunch more CapEx. And it may be by the time we get to that point, the best economic answer is really build yourself a little bridge, an EMIB-like bridge. For us, we would put it in the module and, and then use the RDL for things that don't require a one micron line in space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, but I think, yeah, 1.5 seems to be a place where the I.O. designers can actually benefit in size uh, moving from 2 to 1.5. Going to 1, I think, is going to be a big, uh, big step change for the industry. And so there'll be a lot of thought on how best to do that. Will it, will it really be go to 1.1 one, one, or will we have a combination of, of bridges and let's say 1.5 and 1.5, you know, something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that really makes sense in our advanced packaging field. We really have to balance the economics and the technology, yeah, right? How do definitely. we make it to high volume production and yep. cost down? Um, yep, so true. That's right. And we have one question from Chi Ping Li, kind of related. You mentioned this in your answer for hybrid mm -hmm. bonding, right? Do you see OSAS like MCOR investing and participating in a Damascene based uh, bonding process? So uh, I think uh, you're talking about a hybrid bond where it's an oxide to oxide or something like that. Um, yes, I mean, we, we want to be ready for that. So it's 
it's not absolutely clear what the business model will look like. Um, I'm sure there will be some uh, 3D integration that takes place at the foundry and then that that sandwich comes to the packaging house to to package. But there are other products where you know they they would probably like to have an OSAT alternative for doing that. And what does it take to do it? You know, if you dig into hybrid, the the money you're going to spend on that is getting down to you know a class one environment to get it done. Um, the technology for wafer to wafer that's already out there. It's demonstrated in high volume, but getting placement accuracy for chip on wafer hybrid and super fine pitch you know contacts that is quite another leap in technology. So we're looking hard at it. We have done a lot of work on it to understand where the edge of the technology is. And I think, you know, in combination with some of our tier one customers, uh, when that investment is, is due, we will make that investment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sounds great. Thank you. Any other question uh, from the audience? You can unmute uh, or type it in the chat box. I think um, I think we've, uh, we've got another seven minutes left. I, I want to leave the seven minutes for some networking. Uh, okay, sounds good. Other. But um, I mean, uh, let's give a round of applause to Amy Leon for another Yay! Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Job today. I mean, Mike, thank you again for your presentation and filling in last minute again. Thank you very much. And, uh,